I wanted to show you a bit of my bedroom, but you know, you know, primarily the art in my bedroom. This is a sergeant, of course, I love it. And this is a local artist, Lubo Biro. This is a this is a construction that looks so ancient, like it like it went back thousands of years. It's just gorgeous. And over in the corner, of course, there's Hopper, another sailing picture I like very much. Those waves are so menacing and eerie and another impressionistic work that I like very much. It kind of makes the room light up. And here's something I did on a rainy day. I just wanted to make my windows a little bit more imaginative, like a window into the world of the imagination. So I put that together. Another seagoing watercolor by Homer. They're just gorgeous. They catch the light of those tropic areas so wonderfully. I like to wake up to it. And this one especially, which is right across from my bed. So when I wake up, I'm staring at it. It's uh, called Caribbean Venus or Venus Carib. It's, it's a Spanish title. It was done by Otto Apui, a painter in Costa Rica my son put me together with. And this is a portrait by me, by, uh, of me by Jamie Townsend, a Ringling student. And again, some things I picked up on my travels. I like to assemble them and put them into little groups or altars, I like to call them. The statue in front is a prehistoric one. It goes way back. And here's a, a beautiful stained glass panel made for me by Linda Niblock. I have another one in the living room that just changes the way the light comes into the room. And then another close look at this ancient looking frieze by Lubo Biro. It's just the most fascinating construction. It's an abstract really, but it looks like it's a representational frieze like you'd see on the side of a ancient building. You know? Figures seem to be moving back and forth there in the dark area. And again, I... I just sleep better. I like these around me when I go in at night to sleep. They're, a, they're good dream companions. Everything in the room is a good dream companion, I think, you know. And let me take one more look at the room. So again, this is across from my bed. and You can see the size of that painting and how gorgeous it is. And I guess when I was filming this, I had something on. It was a performance piece by my partner called Soul Moves by Scylla Liscom. And, oh yeah, this is a little piece I have in my window. It was hard to photograph. It's called The Shallows of Anna Maria, again by Nancy Matthews. She has a, just the weirdest sense of humor. There's, there's just enough darkness in it to really give it some punch. And then there's that whimsy and that imagination. Her whole house is like that, by the way. It's something if you get a chance to visit it up in Bradenton. And then back to my wonderful hopper. And I just love that painting. I didn't know he had done sea scenes until very late in my life. When I saw that one, I just grabbed it right away. Of course, they're prints, you know. I couldn't afford the, the originals. I would like to change some things. If I were to go back in my life, I would like to change things. You know, as a kid, my left eye crossed at a very early age. I was a very nervous kid. I think I took all of my parents' conflicts. I, they had to be conflicted parents, too. They came from troubled backgrounds, you know, as disciplined as they were, as loving as they were. They, they had their hands full of being parents. I think that I internalized all of those. So by the age of three, I was wearing glasses for a severely crossed left eye. I was stammering. I can't tell you how much I stammered. I stammered all the way through my life until I finally started to do oral poetry, where I realized that was my true voice, and I stopped stammering. You know, it was just amazing. It would be nice to go back to those days as a kid and have none of that happen, have none of the stammering, the crossed eyes, and the nervous stomach, or all of that stuff that made my childhood hard for me, you know, the moving from place to place, never having friends, you know, it was a, thank God we had a big family, it was tough when we moved, just making new friends or finding new friends. 
But yet at the same time, I wouldn't be the same person. You know, I had to overcome all of that. I can, sometimes when I think of what I have overcome, when you look at me now, and I have two eyes that work, they just uncross themselves, I stop stammering. My level of nervousness has gone down, you know, anxiety, all of that. That has happened because I somehow, all of those things kind of it, it pushed me eventually into the world of poetry, or it was the only way that I, it was the only way that was complex enough to express what I was going through. So it became the art that I eventually took up. So in some ways I'd like to have changed them, but I know if I did, I'd be a completely different person, probably completely worthless. You know, as I've become older, a little closer to the grave, as they say. I've started to think a little bit about how I'd like to be remembered. There's no way to change how I'll be remembered by people, really. I mean, my kids have their own picture of me, and the people that I've lived with, my former wives and friends, and whatever, they pretty much have a fixed picture. And there's nothing really you can do about that. That's basically what happens in life, is people have memories of you. But if I had my druthers, if in some way I could kind of influence that in some way, I'd like to be remembered as somebody who always honored the truth, who tried to tell the truth, both in his personal life and also in his art. You know, I think if you don't do that, you're kind of wasting your time in life. You're not really doing what you should do. The truth is beautiful and what is beautiful is true. You know, Keats said that and it's really true about the way you approach life. If you honor the truth, then your life and the work that you do will have some substance to it and some beauty. So that's why I think that honoring the truth has been important to me. It's an instinct. I can see why it's one that has been honored by many, many, many people. You know, I wanted to make this video not so much for my own kids. They know who I am or they have a pretty good picture, nor for my brothers and sisters. They have a pretty good picture of who I am, you know. But down the road, two or three, four, four generations, there's nobody going to have a memory of me at all. I like sometimes to, to think if I had something like this of my grandfather's or my grandfather's grandfather so I could reach back and touch them, not the facts and the figures, but to, but to feel who they were, and to feel there was some kind of emotional link between myself and them, to have some little kid in the future look at this who found it in his closet or his father's closet, some great, great, great something and put it in the DVD player, saying, wow, look at this guy. He's my great, great, great uncle. You know, to have that touch, I want that. And I think that's what my great grandkids and great grand nephews and nieces would like, just to touch somebody. That's what I like it to be, just a touching point.